So I'm Reverend Dean Nelson, and I serve as the chairman of the Frederick Douglass Foundation and the Douglass Leadership Institute. Uh, I currently serve as a senior fellow for African American Affairs at the Family Research Council, and I'm also the national outreach director for Human Coalition. And I probably should mention that I am also a commissioner, a federal commissioner on the commission for the bicentennial uh, of Frederick Douglass. So okay. uh, that's a great honor. Yeah. And what is that position? Uh, what, what is your task? Yeah. So uh, myself and uh, the other, I think, 13 commissioners basically have the responsibility of hosting events and promoting the life and legacy of Frederick Douglass, uh, honoring his 200th birthday. So we've done scores of programs, one in Rochester when I was there, um, and then some other events around the country, just kind of helping America become reacquainted with uh, the great abolitionist. So. That's awesome. I'm going to try to make my vocal response less because I don't want that recorded, but I will nod and such, so just assume <laughs> yeah. that I'm saying. <laughs> All right. This is a more general question. Um, why does the study of our history matter? Yeah, I think it's been said that if people don't uh, remember their history, then they're doomed to repeat it. And I think that it's important for uh, any culture, any people to be able to appropriately study and remember uh, their history uh, so that they can avoid some of the pitfalls from the past. And so I think those are some good reasons that we should really think seriously about our past um, so that we can hopefully uh, prepare for our future. Yeah, that's good. Those length answers in general are, are real good, um, okay. unless you go on a trail like you're hitting something, <laughs> just keep plowing away, that's fine. Um, so tell us briefly, uh, what would you want people to know about Frederick Douglass and what he did? Man, I first learned about Frederick Douglass when I was a kid. Um, my mother brought home like these comic books, these African-American golden legacy comic books. And I remembered out of all of the comic books, there was one figure who had two comic books dedicated to his life, and that was Frederick Douglass. And so when I think back uh, on those days and how I have learned about Frederick Douglass over the years, I think I would like people to remember uh, his dedication to, to the Lord. Um, he had a great and incredible encounter with God as a, uh, as a teenager. And I think that forever shaped who uh, he would become. Uh, I think that informed his thoughts and ideas about liberty, about justice. And I think that if people don't highlight or remember uh, kind of that aspect of Frederick Douglass in terms of his faith, I think that they will really miss uh, who he was and the legacy that he left behind. Wow, that's cool. What can you uh, expand just a little bit? What was that encounter? What did it look like? Yeah, so, you know, during, you know, that time period, this would have been in the, you know, the, uh, you know, 1830s, uh, there was a revival movement that was taking place largely with, uh, with Methodists and Methodism around the country, and uh, it impacted, you know, all of uh, America at that time. And it came through uh, Maryland, and they had some revivalists that would preach to slaves. And so in uh, Maryland and the Baltimore area, uh, that, that happened, and Frederick Douglass uh, got caught up uh, in that and uh, attended some of that hearing um, revivalist preaching, and uh, after hearing revivalist uh, preaching for some period of time, uh, he said essentially he recognized how much of a sinner he was and knew that he was in need of God's saving grace. And after experiencing that, uh, he basically described uh, his life in a brand new light. He said, I had new animations. He said, I loved everybody, slaves and slaveholders alike. He says, I abhorred slavery all the more, but now my life was set on a course where all I desired to do was to let others know uh, the liberty that came through Jesus Christ. Wow. That is awesome. <laughs> Um, why did he come to Rochester? 
Frederick Douglass, uh, when he was traveling with uh, William Lloyd Garrison and some of the Garrisonians, traveled through the Northeast, uh, New England, and through New York. And somewhere around that time period in the early 1840s, he would have visited uh, Rochester and likely would have preached. Um, there are a number of reasons probably why. One, I think as he was you know, having a, a family, I think he wanted to be involved in a, in a, uh, a city that was, we could say, progressive. Uh, you know, at least it was open. Uh, you know, it was obviously a free city. So I think that he thought about his family. But also there's um, some speculation, too, why he settled there. Um, and that was because he did have a break with, uh, with Garrison uh, over a number of, of issues. Um, Douglas was traveling in Europe, um, got greater notoriety, um, had some new supporters and donors, and really felt the need to establish his own newspaper, the North Star. And I think for those reasons, he uh, decided to plant his roots there in the city of Rochester, as well as probably the fact that it was a, uh, a stop on the Underground Railroad. So not only was Frederick Douglass, you know, a great abolitionist traveling around, he started the North Star, but then also he was one who gave his time uh, and his substance for helping to free blacks through the Underground Railroad. And uh, Rochester was a very important stop before folks could get to Canada. Um, this is for, for my own knowledge, but uh, are you aware that the city itself became called or labeled the North Star as well? I had not been aware of the fact that Rochester itself as a city was named the North Star, but uh, obviously, you know, Frederick Douglass and slaves had looked to the North Star. I mean, there were you know, songs and uh, quotes always about kind of looking to the North Star to escape from slavery. And that was kind of uh, Harriet Tubman, uh, Frederick Douglass, and others who kind of participated with the Underground Railroad would use uh, the North Star as kind of a gauge and a guide uh, to uh, direct them to freedom. And so uh, it became a popular, you know, title. Frederick Douglass, of course, uh, would call his newspaper that, but um, I'm not surprised that Rochester would also take take on that that name because it was a very important destination point uh, for slaves when they got there. Okay, very good. All right, I didn't even ask that one, but you answered it. Why did you name this paper the North Star? <laughs> um, some of these questions are going to sound pretty redundant, but they might pull out a different way of saying the answers. You know. Yeah. Um, so what effect did he have on the area and across the country? So Frederick Douglass, you know, I, I like to refer to him as, you know, America's most formidable statesman, you know, somebody who lived in slavery but then, you know, rose above it and helped to, uh, to free others and was a great, um, you know, I guess minister of justice if we could think about him in that way. Um, so he aroused the conscience of the nation, um, getting the attention of you know President Lincoln and and others, and so his impact was was great. His impact was also felt you know in the city. I mean, not always originally welcomed uh, in the city of Rochester when he first got there, but because he was such a likable but profound individual, um, the city would learn to fairly quickly embrace him and other uh, notables um, like Susan B. Anthony and others would, uh, would draw attention to him and, and collaborate with him there in the city of Rochester. So I think that um, his influence, uh, his reach, and just his great personality uh, seemed to draw people and uh, engage people, particularly those who uh, sought to advance, you know, righteousness and justice in the culture. Yeah, that's good. All right. Um, yeah, should we start touching on the next one? Um, what was his connection with Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, women's suffrage? Yeah, so, you know, I 
think back, you know, when you visit Rochester, you know, there's that, that, that statue of uh, Frederick Douglass and Susan B. Anthony having tea. And I think that the social aspect of um, connecting with uh, people like Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, where they would discuss kind of the future of, you know, our country and the movements that they were a part of. And I think that that's where uh, Frederick Douglass learned a lot firsthand of the women's suffrage movement through his involvement, uh, both with uh, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. It seemed to be, um, you know, interesting that though it was his desire first to see uh, slavery ended. And there was a little bit of, uh, of a challenge, particularly with Elizabeth Cady Stanton during that time period, um, because obviously they were fighting for one thing and he was fighting for uh, another thing in terms of its premacy, you know. But uh, eventually uh, they would work together after the, uh, the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments are passed. Frederick Douglass would turn uh, a great deal of his attention to the um, uh, advocacy for women's rights and probably was the first most notable man to uh, fully endorse and get behind uh, the women's suffrage movement. And uh, I think that um, history will, will show that his work with Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony um, ended up being um, quite compatible and uh, advancing such a great cause as women's suffrage. Yeah, that's good to know. <clears throat> I've been hearing, uh, we've been hearing a lot, I don't know why lately, but about the rub between them and, you know, that sort of thing, but um, it's good to hear that even afterwards, it, you know, I, I guess I would ask historically then, when uh, when he spoke at um, in Seneca Falls, mm -hmm. Uh, was this before the falling apart or after, you know, as far as the rub in the relationship? Um, yeah, you know, I would, I would pause on answering that only because I'm not certain when I kind of trying to think about the, the timeline um, because they worked together. But I think that it was, pro it was specifically when they were trying to see if they could get uh, the 13th, after the 13th Amendment was passed, they were trying to say, hey, look, can we get both women and blacks uh, the right to vote? Uh, and it looked like, you know, politically it was too big of a, of a lift. And so Douglas was like, hey, look, I'm going to fight first for black men to have the right to vote um, because they have been disenfranchised completely. They, you know, black women don't even have a husband that they can get to go to the polls to vote. So I think that that was where the Douglas's emphasis was. But um, as reported again, they, they would soon come back together and, and, and work, work well together. Good. This is a more general question of the era, but uh, what made social reform movements such as abolition and women's suffrage, you know, things like that, why were they so effective at that time in American history? Can you comment on that? You know, you think back, America was basically approaching its 100th year birthday, right? 1860s, you know, moving towards 1870s. And I think that, um, you know, in the history of any civilization or any culture, um, ideas, you know, their time had come, you know, because even at the very beginning of the founding of America, you had some states that did not you know, want slavery in some states that did. Um, and even in states like Virginia that was a slave state, there were always movements to try and, um, you know, eradicate slavery or to end slavery as a, as a practice. But I think that as you saw more um, black men like Frederick Douglass um, that could do more than just, you know, work as a slave, people began to recognize, you know, shouldn't we really be having this discussion um, about, you know, the efficacy of full rights for all people? And so I think that just as time progressed, as education uh, advanced, as, um, you know, you had citizens like Frederick Douglass and Susan B. Anthony as formidable figures, 
as the population saw them more, I think that it would be harder to deny those type of people, you know, the right to, to vote and uh, to be full citizens and to participate in our, uh, our civilization. Yeah, that's good. Um, I got a question here. Do you see a connection between the Finney revival, 1830-31, the, the first big revival there in Rochester, um, having a, an effect or a, a leading towards these social reforms just a, you know, a few decades later, or already in motion? Maybe, but. I think without a doubt, uh, particularly for someone like Finney, who thought that, you know, if there was real revival, that it should have an impact on the culture. And he was one who not only preached uh, salvation in you know, Jesus Christ alone, but also preached that there should be an outworking of one's transformation. And I think because of that, you saw the elevation of women. Uh, you, it could be argued, I think many historians would agree, that during that time period, the idea that um, if you were a Christian, then you were a brother or a sister, and that was a sense of, of equity. So women shouldn't be placed in a lower status. If they're brothers and sisters, they should be on some level of equal footing. So I think that that elevated um, the status of, of women. I think that uh, the same thing with a brother who happened to be of a different hue. I think that his message uh, pierced uh, the conscience of the culture, and he preached very strongly, right after salvation, he preached very strongly, um, you know, the end of slavery. So uh, he was uh, not just a, a revivalist in terms of trying to get people, uh, you know, out of hell into heaven, but also that idea of thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven, I think was a theme that helped to elevate the status of both blacks and women. I don't know if you know these specifics. Um, I mean, of course, we're doing our own research and can bring some of this out, but my question is what effect did Douglas's influence have on the Christian churches of Rochester and what are considered the longer range social, well, kind of two questions, the longer range social effects? You're kind of talking into these things already, mm -hmm. um, but do you know anything specific of, you know, even where he attended church or anything around Rochester church? Yeah, so Frederick Douglass was a, a licensed uh, African Methodist Episcopal minister, and he would choose um, the AME Zion Church there in Rochester uh, where he would fellowship, and that's also the same place that he would set up, uh, you know, the print shop for the North Star. So I think working in the church was a very important aspect of Douglass's mindset. And, you know, we even see that effect, you know, within the African-American community today. Um, I'm not as well versed on how well he worked with, um, you know, the Methodist movement in Rochester, but as one who certainly was impacted by the revival um, movement, I think that he would have certainly been, uh, you know, his work would have been compatible with uh, with the other work that was going on throughout the city. But it would be interesting for me to know a little bit more about how he worked with um, you know white churches um, in you know in the city of Rochester, and maybe even outside of just the Protestant uh, movement. Um, Douglas did work uh, some with Catholics, you know when he was in Ireland. Uh, and in England, traveling around, uh, helping to see, um, you know, the elevation of, you know, people in different, you know, groups even there. So it would be real interesting to know more about, you know, how he worked with, uh, with other evangelicals and other folks there in Rochester. Yeah, that's, that's interesting point about the Catholics. I'll do a little more research down that path. So you've done it a little bit more. What more can you tell us um, about the spiritual Christian side mm -hmm. of Frederick Douglass? I think one of the things to note was it wasn't just Douglass himself, but also his wife, Anna. Uh, together, they raised children uh, in a very decidedly Christian home. 
as you read some of the stories from uh, both Douglas and Anna, as well as some of the writings of their children, uh, they would talk about how they were required to learn scripture and to quote scripture at the dinner table, uh, how they had a, a commitment to comporting themselves as, uh, as honorable, uh, decent Christians um, in, in all of their life and in their livelihood. So I think that that's one. Also, if you listen to Douglas's messages, uh, his speeches, you can't get away from the, uh, the biblical uh, allusions, the, uh, the biblical phrases. One of the quotes I remember, he says that, you know, I have one great political idea, the best expression of it, he says, I have found in the Bible. It is in substance, righteousness exalts a nation's sin as a reproach to any people. So Douglas would be quoting parts of the Bible like that scripture from Proverbs. So I think that that's something that's important uh, for people to know and to remember, um, whether it was in his writings, whether it was in his speeches, Douglas would often um, make a call to um, biblical premise that all men are created equal, uh, endowed by their creator. You know, so he would uh, use biblical texts as well as you know even the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. So those are some things I think that are really important to to know and to remember about Frederick Douglass with his devotion to God. Um, he never strayed away. Some people try to make the case that, you know, maybe later in his life because he studied other religions and things like that, but uh, he never drifted from his, uh, his commitment to the Lord as well as his biblical orientation for justice, uh, even at the very end of his life, actually being um, uh, funeralized here in Washington, D.C., uh, not far from, uh, from here, actually a... Um, uh, Metropolitan AME Church that's uh, here in Washington, D.C. So uh, from the very beginning of his conversion experience all the way through uh, the end of his life, uh, Douglas would be known and remembered as um, a person of righteousness and justice with that foundation being found uh, in Jesus Christ. Here's an interesting one. Um, how would Douglas define his personal identity? Now, let me set this one up a little more. Um, you know, there, over the years, we've heard a lot of good church teaching of, um, you know, talking about you know the Israelites coming out of slavery, you know, not having that slave mentality, spiritually mm -hmm. speaking, mm -hmm. or an orphan kind of spirit, you know. Yeah. Um, obviously, he could have carried that identity, but obviously, mm -hmm. somehow he shook that up and became a totally new person. You know, he didn't yeah. let that weigh him down. I don't think. Um, <laughs> So how would you speak into how Douglas sees his own identity and the transformation of his identity? Yeah, you know, again, I think stemming from um, kind of a, a Christian uh, conversion experience, Douglas, um, and maybe argued even before then, always seemed to have a great appetite for learning. Um, and he was constantly reading, constantly writing. Um, it could be argued that his thoughts uh, even evolved a little bit over, over a period of time. Um, I'm thinking about one of his famous speeches, which was called Self-Made Men. And I think that in many ways, that's who Douglas was, that's who he became. If you think about someone who was not defined by slavery, but was defined by being a man, uh, a person who contributed to um, his own education, his own being. So I think this idea of kind of being all that you can become, um, this idea of if God be for you, who can be against you? I think that that uh, kind of defined who Douglas uh, was because there were, in his mind, there were no limits. I mean, even though in the natural you could say that there were limitations, but he felt that he could overcome obstacles. And we saw that in every aspect of his life, from his education and his pursuit of knowledge to uh, his travel around the world. He would literally travel to uh, Africa towards the end of his years. He would travel to um, you know, England and all throughout Europe. Uh, so I think that, you know, this idea of self-made man, um, that he was not defined by anything else except 
uh, who he wanted to become, and that was certainly a person of dignity. Uh, he wanted to do that not just for himself, but for his people. Um, I think it's often noted that uh, Douglas was the most photographed person uh, of the 19th century, and that was part of his strategy. He wanted to let the world know that a black man could be looked at and could be defined by something different than the caricatures of the day. He could be defined as one who always wore a bow tie. He was one who was always, you won't see a picture of Frederick Douglass uh, looking any way other than very dignified and uh, often um, in a more serious tone, even though people talk all the time about how humorous of a person he was, but when he was photographed, he was photographed because he was trying to demonstrate someone of dignity, someone of worth, and I think that that's a good way of, uh, of thinking about how Frederick Douglass defined himself. Yeah, that's really good. All right, this is my last written question. <laughs> Uh, well, this is more like for my information, I guess, but what are some uh, key quotes or speeches that we definitely should have in this film you know, that we don't want to miss out on? Uh, what comes to mind? Yeah, so certainly self-made men, uh, that was one that became popular. He would give that many times. Um, the famous one, of course, that he gave, I want to say in the 1850s in Rochester was, um, what to the Negro is the 4th of July? Um, that was a uh, profound speech and probably today one of the ones that is referred to and quoted most often. Uh, in that speech, he does talk about uh, the Constitution as being actually a pro-freedom document, not a pro-slavery document, as was uh, instructed to him years before by William Lloyd Garrison. When I think about some quotes, one of the ones that's favorite of mine is regarding uh, family. He says, it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. And I think that that's a profound statement really for any, any generation. And um, Douglas is someone who did not know who his biological father was. He didn't uh, really have a relationship with his mother. But once, you know, he got married to Anna, had a dedication to his wife and to, uh, and to his family. Um, I'm thinking there, there's another one that's, uh, I don't know if people are you know, pro-Second Amendment, but I, uh, I, I like this one where Douglas says, a man's rights are secured in three boxes. He says, the ballot box, the jury box, and the cartridge box, which for you know, blacks during that time period, um, having the right to bear arms was important because that was the way that they were able to protect themselves uh, even from quote unquote, the law that should have been working, you know, for them. So um, that's one. There's another one, you know, real simple, where Douglas was quoted just saying, agitate, agitate, agitate. And that was his mindset within a culture to fight for what you believed. You couldn't just kind of think that people were going to give you your freedom, that you had to fight for it, that you had to become an agitator to get what you desired. Um, and I think in a similar way, he would uh, say something like um, regarding progress, that uh, you had to fight for it because it was never going to be given. And um, so those are just a few. There are a lot of great quotes. I mean, if you can think about somebody who gave as many speeches as Douglas did, um, there were a lot of uh, a lot of great quotes. And people, again, talked often about how funny he was in uh, in terms of his delivery. That's great. Um, I I read some of the things about how he sounded, you know, and uh, you know, I understood that he would start his speeches kind of personal and sort of quiet, and then by the end he'd be mm -hmm. like. You know, some big crescendo, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Do you know, did he speak with an accent? Did he have like a southernish accent? I know he's from Maryland, but was there any accent to it as we would think of today? Is that known? It's a good question. None that I, I ever read. He was fluent uh, in German. Uh, he also, you know, studied the classics and languages, but um, not that I ever knew that it was an accent. One interesting 
thought, though, uh, during the time period when he first began speaking around the country, one of the reasons that he wrote the first uh, autobiography was because some people began to question, could someone who speaks so well, who's so profound, have ever been a slave? And so that was, a, uh, that was an early question mark uh, when he was speaking around the country, um, was this guy speaks so well, is so intelligent, is it even possible that he was, he was once a slave? And so that's part of the reason that he writes his first book, um, Narrative, but, uh, which was primarily used um, as kind of a, a story, a personal story of, 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 of a black person in, in slavery. But Douglas ends up living longer, and then by the 1850s writes My Bondage, My Freedom, which, because he had now lived free just as long as he had been a slave, and I thought that it was really important for him to tell the story, hey, look, I wasn't just a slave, but I've done a lot of things now, you know, as a free person. And then he ends up living to be 77, long enough where he does write a third version of the autobiography, which is referred to as The Life and Times of Frederick Douglass. And uh, both or all three of those uh, were important pieces, um, but it's great to be able to read the last one to kind of get the mindset and the ideas of someone who has not just lived in slavery, not just lived being free, but now has actually seen his world change. I mean, the, the world that he lived in once America was a slaveholding state and now blacks were now full citizens uh, participating within, uh, you know, the American experiment. Awesome. Well, that's everything. I got one more that I'll ask. Um, okay. Is there anything you can imagine that, like the nugget that, like, nobody knows this about Frederick Douglass. Something mm. so interesting. <laughs> like, wow, where did you get that, you know, that kind of thought? Anything come to mind? Wow, I'm trying to think what would be the one like one thing. I mean, there's so many interesting things about Douglas from, you know, his time with the Freedmen's Bureau where he saw that, but maybe maybe one is Douglas and this kind of goes back to a question that you asked earlier about, you know, how would he define himself? But he he quoted one thing about himself. He basically said that he always wanted to be true to himself. And in so doing, Douglas kind of had this, I don't know, this, uh, this rebellious streak, I almost want to say, where uh, he would challenge the status quo, even to the point where after his beloved Anna would die, uh, went into deep depression. But then, you know, under two years later, he would marry someone who was much younger and someone who was white. Uh, again, like always defying, this kind of quiet defiance that Frederick Douglass had um, because it was against the law, right? And uh, certainly right here in uh, D.C. and in Virginia for a black person to marry a white person. But uh, even towards the end of his life, this defiant Frederick Douglass, which you could see all throughout his life from the time period that he fought his slave breaker, from the time period that he would, you know, challenge, you know, William Lloyd Garrison, uh, from the pulpit and from uh, from the stage, he would even challenge preachers uh, who he thought often um, would sway people to thinking about the hereafter rather than what should be happening right now. So uh, I think that defiant streak uh, of Frederick Douglass would be something to be remembered. Yeah, that's cool. I actually have a question. I have yeah. a question. <laughs> well, when you answer it, look at me. Yes, <laughs> we'll do. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> with the people of Haiti because it was the first free republic. They had actually um, freed slaves before the U.S. did. Um, and in his time there, did he talk about how he related to the people and how, um, because they were agitators and overthrew Napoleon. So he's now walking into this and seeing maybe a reflection of himself. and. Um, Wondering what you've read about that and what he said about that. You know, some people don't remember that Frederick Douglass served five presidents, and one of his last assignments was uh, an appointment to, to Haiti. 
And one of the things that was noted that the people of Haiti certainly loved and revered him, I think that he had a great appreciation for the people in, in, in Haiti because they were uh, a group of, of blacks who fought. And again, that idea of Frederick Douglass being an agitator, that defiance. So he, he certainly had a great deal of affection. The people there really loved him. And there are uh, a number of personal letters that he actually has uh, back and forth to uh, the leadership there in Haiti, but uh, definitely had great affection for the people. Cool. All right. I think we got it. That's excellent. Yeah, that That's excellent, awesome. man. Gave Thank you so, so much. much.